So I have been doing um, since January a series of recurring workshops with the Green Social Organizing Project. Um, that's the organization that we founded out of the Hot Topic Water Campaign in 2020. Um, the recurring workshops have been uh, Green Party 101, Eco Socialism 101, Organizing 101, repeat. Um, we update them every month, um, but basically all, and each one of those workshops gets done quarterly. Um, the goal of those workshops has been both kind of some political education, some skills education, and some uh, onboarding, right? Especially like the Green Party and the Eco Socialism 101s. Those are you know, good initial entry point into um, you know, working with the Green Party. Um, and the hope is that when you, you, know, you watch our live stream and we talk about you know, getting involved in your state party and things like that, and that, it, you know, that spurs you to, yeah, I do want to do something. Um, we're the Green Socialist Organizing Project, and it shouldn't be surprised that our, you know, our three our Green Party, Socialism, and Organizing. Um, and we chose, you know, especially the organizing because we think it's a really, really, really essential thing that the Green Party has to do, right? Um, when you look at politics today, what you see is largely messaging and media-based politics, right? They send you mailers, they pay for ads. There's very little interpersonal connection um, from candidates these days. And, and I'm, in, at least in my personal experience, and maybe it's because I'm listed as a hostile husband, on my wife's account in the van um, because I did throw a Democratic, you know, House candidate off my court when she would when she tried to, you know, waffle on Medicare for all in 2020. But I was told by a friend of the Democrats that I'm marked as a hostile person to them. And they might just not knock on my door for that reason. But in my experience, they're not knocking on doors anymore. Um, the Republicans are doing a far better job, you know, from what I've seen than knocking on doors. And so those media messages aren't very effective. Right? When you, I'm pretty sure every single person in the United States right now would like to never, ever, ever get another piece of political mail. Right? I'm getting like four a day from competing candidates. Like I, the other day, I got two from one and one from the other of the same candidates in the same race. I get multiple things from them every week. Um, those pieces of paper aren't moving me. Right? When I, I don't, I don't have you know normal television, so. You're not going to see, I'm not going to see computer ads or, or TV ads or anything. Um, but TV ads and radio ads, they don't really move people. Um, they, they don't engage people. They don't get people involved. And they don't, you know, they, they just make your voters feel like you're out there. Um, how do, so the question becomes how do we actually grow the Green Party, right? And we don't have the money to compete when it comes to. Um, you know, paying for ads, paying for time, right? That kind of stuff. So we've got to do a bottom-up grassroots and we've got to do it in person, right? With it. One thing that I've found, and I think I'll, I think there's a point on it in the slides, but in an interpersonal conversation, you can actually move someone, right? You can change their position. You can get them to acknowledge things that, you know, and, and that they support, that, they, that doesn't happen if you're in a fight with someone on Facebook. Right, that that person to person, that face to face is where we can actually make an impact. Um, that person to person, that face to face is where I have Democrats, when I explain the ballot access situation in Illinois, say, "Oh, that's atrocious." Right? Their party put it in power. In a Facebook post, they're just going to walk away and ignore it. But when I actually talk to them and I say, "Your candidate has to collect 750 signatures to run for the U.S. House right here in Springfield," I have to collect more than fifteen thousand. When they're standing right in front of you, they can't just write that off because it's so atrocious, right? So organizing is really, really key to what we need to do to grow the Green Party, right? It's not posting more on social media. It's not, you know, um, sending out mailers and buying ad time. It's knocking on doors and talking to people. So some, you know, some starting affirmations, right? Because this is big. Organizing is a big thing, and organizing in a a neoliberal capital state is even bigger, right? There's just so much we need to address. So some starting affirmations. No one needs permission to begin organizing in their communities. You can do it, right? 
Good organizing is built first and foremost on trust and real relationships. Working class people rightfully don't trust politicians. Actions, not words, are what matter, right? Working class communities have had people come in every two years and make promises that they have no intention in keeping, right? Working class, class communities are rightfully distrustful. And when Greens come in and say, well, our platform would support you, if they don't know us, how are we any different than the Republican and Democrat that came to make those same empty promises, right? How you know it's not an empty promise is by having a relationship and having trust with that person. Um, don't let yourself get overwhelmed. Start with one or two things, right? If we were to make a list of all the issues in our society, we did, you know, and, and put them all on the board here, it'd probably depress half of us into just giving up, right? The, the things that we're facing are huge. The problems in our society are nearly total, right? There, there's really nowhere that we don't need to address them. So if you jump in and you're going to fix the world, you're setting yourself up with a step, a jump that's too big. With a load that's too big to carry at your current capacity. So start where you can win some things, right? The, the, in organizing, and now enough can be said for the simple win, right? For getting that little victory that, that gives you some momentum that you can build on to the next victory, and the next victory, and the next victory, and now we're electing people, right? But if we start, if we jump right out of the bat, we found a local and we're going to run for Congress. Right here in Illinois, that means we can collect 30,000 signatures in 90 days from within a single district. Just getting on the ballot, if you don't have a existing local with organization with you know organizational network set up, is a barrier that we all that we usually can't overcome. Right? Make sure you do the, the prep work and the planning. If you're always shooting from the hip, it's hard to be effective. Decide on measures and metrics to determine how something is successful, right? Winning the election isn't the only thing that can determine success. How many new people did we bring into the organization? How many new contacts, right? What relationships with the other organizations, with decision makers, with influencers did we? And I'm using the word influencers loosely. I don't mean people on Instagram, right? I mean people in their communities. What kind of, you know, how many doors did we knock, right? Um, I, 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 this is going to sound harsh, but if your campaign can't tell me how many doors you knocked, I don't think you have a serious campaign because you're not tracking a simple metric. Um, Illinois just got our first green mayor, in Peter Schwartzman, um, in Galesburg. And after his victory, Peter spoke to the Illinois Green Party at one of these uh, membership meetings. He told us how many days in a row he knocked doors. He told me how many, he told us how many volunteers he had, how many doors they knocked, right? And this isn't just some guy knowing some statistics about his campaign. This is someone who won, showing us the steps that we have to take to win, right? Showing us the metrics that matter if we're going to win, right? We don't have the money. So we're, the metric of how much money do we raise is never really going to be one. This is a huge value to determining whether or not we're going to compete. How many doors we knock, though? How many voters do we talk to, especially in small races, right? When you're running through your local library board, if you talk directly to a thousand people, you can have that one, right? Maybe not in you know a large metro in a metropolitan area, but even here in someone like here, somewhere here like Springfield, right? We can have a huge, you know, talking to a relatively small number of people face to face, getting their support and bringing them out to vote for you can be the difference between winning and losing. And if you never do knock on that door, they won't know who you are, and they won't be able to come out and vote for you. And, and there are and another thing to note, you know, when, when making this organizing workshop, there are very few resources related to independent political organizing, right? Most are organized, oriented towards not for profit, not for profit advocacy groups and the Democratic Party that they feed into. Um, don't be afraid to try new things. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Right, because when you're trying to find resources to do this, what you find is that they don't really exist in a way that's oriented towards us. So that means what we do find, we need to be able to take and kind of alter, right, to make it work for us. Um, AJ, if anybody's got any, you know, anything. There's somebody your mic be. You sound a little muddy on the mic, but. Okay. 
Hey, Todd. Is it better if I talk loud? <laughs> if I turn on a teacher voice and I lose the kind of echo that happens with the mic? Do we need to just move the computer closer to you and turn it this way? Do because I sound better it, now? Like isn't it? Awesome. They're just getting the mic there through the PA system to here. So you want to just turn it around and so the mic is, is it the mic on this side or on yeah. the other side? Yeah. Is anyone responding? No. No one responded? No. You're good. Okay. So, speakers are you know, the key with the inspirational stuff, They're right? More this way. What is organizing? Because it's straight ahead. Organizing means engaging with society, doing, not just thinking or talking. And that's from uh, the Creed Party's organizing guide. Organizing is a bottom up philosophical approach to social change, not just a method to achieve it, right? Organizing isn't a step-by-step -step guide. It's a methodology that we can use to bring about change in our, in our communities. And by thinking of it as a methodology, that gives us the adaptability to be able to change. If it's step-by-step -step guide and something doesn't work, now we're kind of in trouble, right? But with, when it's a methodology that, that includes how to solve problems, we can work through that, right? The key to organizing a natural roots is powered by these staples. The key to organizing an alternative society is organize people around what they can do, and more importantly, what they want to do. And that's from Abby Hoffman. It's probably my favorite Abby Hoffman quote. And it's extremely applicable to my experience in the Green Party. New people come into the Green Party, and often they don't have a way that's clear for them to get involved. And the ways that they do have to get involved are often, no offense to us, but boring, right? Business meetings are not exciting things. And they're not, the, they're not everyone's cup of tea. Administrative work is not everyone's cup of tea, right? It's not what everyone wants to do. And so if I come to a meeting and you say, do this thing that you hate, I'm not gonna come back, right? How movements succeed is when they get, when they empower people based on their passions, based on their skills, right? So we really need to think about that. When you've got someone in you that comes in and they're really passionate about something, we shouldn't say, no, nah, we're not really doing that right now. We should say, what can we do to help you get started, right? That's how it sounds. So when we're organizing, I think it's important to think about what we're actually doing, right? What are we actually doing when we're out there? And one way to think about this, is, and this is from Jane Mitchell's No Shortcuts, is to differentiate between a few things. Advocacy, mobilizing, and organizing, right? And these are three distinct things that we do. And we do them all, right? We're going to do them all a little bit. As a political party, advocacy is kind of what we exist for, right? Where where we exist to give a voice to the policy opinions of our members. Um, we have a platform, right, that people can sign on to sign on to that they're supporting. So advocacy is supporting others. In this case, probably us, right? But sometimes other organizations, right? We work with we work with other groups on things, and in that case, we may be supporting their advocacy. But it's supporting others to create social change on your behalf. And oftentimes it's based on this idea that an elite can influence the current system on behalf of people that, but it doesn't involve the grassroots in their leadership and their decision making, right? Um, this has some downfalls, right? And it, this, these downfalls are why it's not organizing. While Greens in Illinois, we're doing. We're sitting in outside the governor's office, demanding a moratorium on fracking. And this was almost a decade ago. The elites, the Sierra Club, and the Illinois Environmental Council, while we were sitting in and protesting outside the governor's office, they were in the governor's office, being party to the legalization of fracking in Illinois. And they they justified it by saying. 
we have the strongest in the strongest fracking rules in the country. It doesn't matter that we can't enforce them because we don't have inspectors, right? But in that case, the membership of the Sierra Club, who is, in my experience, very anti-fracking, saw their leadership go and make a deal to legalize it, right? So advocacy isn't organizing. Advocacy is giving away your power to someone else, fingers crossed that they do the right thing. In that case, they did the wrong thing, right? Um, I actually turned down, I got turned down for a job at the Illinois Environmental Council literally months before that happened. And I'm kind of glad I got turned down because I probably would have ended up resigning as they went in the back room and legalized fracking, um, right? So the advocacy has its value. Um, and as a political party, it's kind of where we strive to position ourselves, but it's also got its shortcomings in that it's very elite and it's top down. Mobilized protest rallies, attending council meetings, it's inward based building organizing, right? When we want to have an event on Medicare for all, we reach out to the people we know who support Medicare for all and we say, come out to this rally, right? Um, when we want to see a change in our, in our local community, we say, come speak at the city council. And we don't ask our neighbor that doesn't agree with us to come speak at the city council, right? Mobilizing is about mobilizing your existing base. And that can be used to build your base, right? From, from people who support you on the issue and aren't involved in your organization, right? So when we go and we talk to people about ranked choice voting, especially here in Illinois, right? There's gonna, I, we have an example where uh, we used to have a, a member who was an executive director, a, a board member for Fair Vote Illinois. And upon hearing the Green Party's position on ranked choice voting, which is, it's great. But in Illinois, ranked choice voting is the current law it means it gets all wrong, right? The Republican and the Democrat. Unless we deal with ballot access, all it does is give the veneer of validity to a wholly unjust system, right? So when that person who wasn't on board with us heard that argument, it changed his mind. And he kind of moved inside and he advocated within his board at, at Fair Vote that they needed to prioritize ballot access, right? He didn't win, <laughs> but he tried. So, you know, mobilizing is about building your base. Mobilizing is about bringing in people who support your issues but aren't involved. Right? But we're still only talking about our people, you know, our people, people on our side of the issue. Organizing is actively working to change the mind of those who disagree and are not engaged in your cause. Right? The good thing for us as Greens, despite the fact that we are often presented as these radical people with these radical ideas, we aren't. Our ideas are generally majoritarian, right? Medicare for all, more than 50% of the population, including more than 50% of Republicans, supports Medicare for all. That's not a radical idea. That's a populist idea. 90 plus percent of Democrats support it. Their politicians don't, right? So in some ways, our organizing problem isn't about the issue, but about how we're doing the work, right? Democrats who support Medicare for all universally voted for someone who opposed it and said he would veto it when they voted for Joe Biden, right? So the problem we have to get, we have to organize around there is strategy, is the electoral strategy, right? And the same goes for the, the Green New Deal has 60 plus percent support amongst the, pop, amongst the voting population. And that's only gonna go up as younger voters just come in and inherit, you know, this, this kind of past we were facing, right? This is a majoritarian idea, right? I think when push comes to shove, most Americans agree that our, our military budget is far too bloated, right? But they continue to vote for Hawk, right? I mean, it, that's a whole other discussion about the negative oriented voting that they have in this country right now, right? They vote against someone, not for the things that we want. But organizing is different from the other two, right? Organizing is bottom up. Organizing is talking to your neighbor. Organizing is changing minds and mobilizing people that, that can change their mind, right? So once we have, when I have a conversation with someone, 
And they go, you know, you're right on this thing. I don't just stop there. I say, cool, come to this city council thing or do it. And listen to us speak and be a member of the class. Right? So there's a difference between these things. Right? And it's important to know what we're doing. And it's not that we always need to be organizing. Sometimes we need to mobilize. Sometimes we need to advocate. But we need to be conscious about what we're doing and not be confused about you know, where we're at, what the work we're actually doing is. Because if all we're doing is advocacy, we can't expect the outcomes that we would see from organizing. Right? Because we're not doing organizing well. So set, first step, setting some goals. Right? Questions to regularly ask, and this is from Mary and Paula. Questions I regularly ask myself when I'm outraged about injustice. What resources exist so I can better educate myself? Right? If there's a problem, we need to know what we're talking about. There's nothing worse than someone advocating for something and not knowing what they're talking about and spreading falsehoods. That's the quickest way to get someone to not trust you at all. Is if you're just speaking out of your ass, right? You got you got to make sure we know what we're talking about what we're talking about. Who's already doing work around this injustice, right? We don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Who can we work with? Who can we partner with? Who can we form coalitions with? Um, you know, or in the case of you know parties, what are our members doing outside of the party, right? If I if I need someone to talk about you know redlining. I'm going to go to AJ, who teaches class on the geography of racism, right? The passion is already there. AJ is already doing that work. So what I what we can do as a party, what I can do as an organizer is uplift their work and get it out there, right? Do I have the capacity to offer concrete support and help them? This is where not taking two months comes into play, right? Not fighting off more than you can see comes into play. If you want to make change, you really have to have an honest conversation with yourself, with your group, with your organization, about can we actually change this? And if the answer is no, what are the steps we can take to do it? Um, something that comes to mind is years ago, when I was a field director for a community organization, one of my organizers and friends on the side wanted to start organizing fast food workplaces in the service industry. And as he started doing his research, what he realized was he wasn't in a position to be able to actually organize a union in the local McDonald's, right? He, he didn't work there. We've all, we all saw with the best, you know, Amazon's a great example, right? Top down outside organizing in Bessemer, Alabama. Failed. And we can talk about all the reasons and the unjust, you know, the, the, the illegal things that Amazon does and the reasons for that, but it did fail. Bottom up organizing in New York, organized by the workers at the Amazon warehouse, won a victory, right? And he had that same problem. He wasn't a McDonald's worker. So it was really hard for him to have these conversations, build the trust, build the organization, and do it. So the question became if he can't do that, how does he help workers and how does he build towards that? And where we kind of ended, and he ended up moving to Chicago for a different job, and it all kind of you know didn't happen. But where we moved to was what he did think. We, what we did think we could do is pass a, a municipal law in Springfield saying that all businesses operating in the city limits of Springfield must provide five paid sick days. At the time in 2012, that was unheard of for that kind of thing, right? It would have been a huge victory. A huge victory for fast food workers in our town, for all service workers, for all workers in our town. And it was winnable, right? All you had to do is go to, if you show up with 50 people at our city council, you fill the room. They can't ignore that, right? If you park, and, and there's only, seven, I think, seven people. So you've only got to get four people on your side to win, right? In terms of leadership. So that was our, our step that we could take. And then once your organization has won that, those fast food workers trust you. And now you can actually have start having conversations about what else do you need? How do we get your union form without getting more fired? Right? So you need to know how you get your conversation about how do I have the capacity to do this? And then you need to ask yourself, is what I'm doing constructive? Is it helping me? 
right? I feel like a lot of times organizers will do this work and it's a passion project, but it doesn't impact people on the ground, right? And it's hard to bring people to your side. It's hard to get people excited about your work if the things you're doing aren't impactful, right? Next up is what are you organizing around? This is Lee Staples again. And Lee Staples lists four things, turf, issue, identity, and workplace, right? And there's probably more, but these are important things to say, you know, when I was talking about, you know, our plan for a, for a municipal sick, you know, paid sick day policy, there's turf involved because it's municipal and there's workplace involved, right? So these can be intersectional and they should be, right? Um, when you're organizing with your local Black Lives Matter, we're talking identity. Same thing with, you know, LGBT, LGBTQIA plus organizations, that's an identity base, right? Um, when we form Green Party Local, they are generally turf based, right? Though we can have caucuses that are identity based, you know, when we form those things. Where you're working matters, right? Um, the, the, it determines your strategies, it determines what you do, it determines your focus. So you need to think about, you know, is this, are, are I organizing around an issue? Or am I organizing around an area? Am I organizing around an event? Right? And then, I really like this other thing from the staples. Who, what, what, from whom, and how can it be achieved? Who is us, right? The membership, the organizers, um, uh, the staff, in, you know, a great world where Green Parties have staffers, right? Um, which, to our credit, no, no, we've done a good job about having a staff. And I think, you know, the way we, we very much understand the value of Having at least a stipend staffer to, to make sure some of those things that involve the practice now. So, who wants what? Who wants what? What are our goals and objectives? From whom? Who can make the decision? Right? Um, one of my proudest organizing moments revolved completely around who could make the decision. And it was when I was working with a community organizer, and we were going to have a community cleanup. And the park district was amazing. They gave us a whole trailer full of chainsaws, and, you know, tools and bags and grabbers and gloves and everything you could need to clean up alleys, to clean up a community. But once we cleaned it up, where did we put the stuff? That came to Public Works. And Public Works had zero interest in helping us. They told us it wasn't their problem. It was exactly their problem. We were cleaning up streets they didn't clean. But they told us it wasn't their problem and they weren't going to help us. So we called and we called and we called and we didn't get it. So it's Thursday and the cleanup is on Saturday. So I called Public Works Department, asked to speak to the director. I was told it wasn't there. And I said, well, can I have a message? And the you know, receptionist said, sure. I said, tell him this is Chris Blankenhorn calling from Action Now. We've been talking about this community cleanup that we're going to do. And I just wanted to tell him Please call me back and tell me where we can take the trash. If I don't hear from you, we will be taking the trash Tuesday night, 5 p.m., dumping it in front of City Hall and holding a press conference about why are we cleaning up the, the, the neighborhoods, that the, the, the low-income Black neighborhood that the city has abandoned. I have never gotten a call back so fast in my life. You know why? Because I made it his problem. Right? Who can change this? Who can bring me change? This one man, in this case, could bring me change. So I pushed the problem onto him. I created a public relations nightmare for him, you know, that was going to end up with him and the whole city and the city council and the mayor being called racist. He called up very fast. He told me a, a, a lot that the city owned in the neighborhood that we were cleaning up, that we could dump the trash. We dumped it there. It was gone first thing Monday morning, because even though he complied, he did not want to leave it on the table that we could show up, right? So in that case, just targeting the who, right? Who can bring about change? I may I put it on the table that his life was about to get really bad because of me. And there's one way to solve it. And he solved it like that, right? So it's an important question to ask. And how can it be accomplished? In that case, extortion was how it could be accomplished, right? A threat. Um, and frankly, it's worked for me numerous times, right? I, when I was an organizer on a campus, 
we were going to have a protest outside the city, uh, outside the student government. And they were pushing back and said, well, you don't have your, you don't have a space requested. And I told the director of student life, there will be a protest. It can be with your approval or without. And I think you want it to be with approval granted, right? It's really important when you're doing these things to think about who can actually make the change. Because sometimes it doesn't take this big campaign. Sometimes it can take this thing from one person's life hell, right? It's just a threat because they don't want that to happen. Right? So who wants what from who and how can it be accomplished? Everything we do, we see asking ourselves these questions. Another super important part of this we use a sales term, qualifying the lead. Who is our roughly base? We should be conscious, be having conscious discussions and center around who we want to be talking to. Right? So that means think about it. what do I care about? And how does it impact the people in my community? Right? Because a lot of the issues that we talk about in green is that international organizations have very localized manifestations, right? What environmental racism looks different here in Springfield than it does in the south side of Chicago, than it does on the north side of Chicago, than it does on the west side of Chicago, right? Uh, who is impacted in different places? Changes, right? So how do these things that I care about impact people around me, right? Who are we in terms of what cult communities that our, or, our organizing group represent? It's important not to try to save other people, right? People don't need a white horse. They don't need us to ride in and save them. They need to be empowered, right? They need to be able to take control of their own lives. Not another master telling them what they need, right? Which is what they have now. Who do we want to be represented by? When we look around the room and we don't see who we want to be represented, we need to ask ourselves, how can we, you know, how can we engage with that community? Whether that community is identity based or local or no, geographically based or anything else, right? When we look around the room and we see a room full of white people, that should tell us we need to have a conversation and a thought about why and how we change that, right? Because as white people, we don't want to go storming into the black community on a white horse telling them what they need, right? It's about empowerment, not advocacy. And who is this one's really, 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 really important. Who has an interest in material change, right? Because a lot of people support issues based on, you know, a philosophical worldview or that it feels right. But when you're just doing it because it's an opinion that doesn't impact you, that's when you see people abandon, right? Someone who doesn't have health care is going to fight tooth and nail to get it because they have a material interest in that change, right? The, the people that, that need it the most are the people that don't have it. The person with great health care that thinks everyone should is far more likely to take an appeasement, right? Is far more likely to take a half solution. Is far more likely when a crackdown comes and uh, consequences are coming on to the organizers to walk away, right? Because for them, it's not about material interests. It's not about their, their material things, right? Um, it's about what they feel. It's about their opinions, right? And there's nothing to degrade people who, whose opinion drives them to do great work because it does, right? And not every person who's, you know, doesn't have a material interest is going to, you know, throw us under the bus when the time comes and when things get hard. But, People who have material interest in change are going to fight a lot harder for it. Right? Which is fine. That's where they are. That brings us to the next point. There should be multiple things. Go on. There should be multiple ways to engage. Right? Business meetings are not for everyone. And when that's the primary access point for a party, we severely limit our potential to engage with the members. Like I said, multiple
political program and a political foundation. And a camel is a horse designed by committee, right? You have five people, ask five people to, to draw you, you know, to draw horse. But you get to do something very, not very unhorse like. Uh, and that's the key part is we took these individual issue based at organizers and we just started throwing our issues at the wall. And we're not trying to intersect, we haven't been very successful in intersecting and connecting them to a broad platform. Okay. I said have multiple ways to engage. Um, DuPage does a pretty good job with this. They did better in the past, right? Um, Carbondale used to do a really good job with this. I used to use Carbondale in my organizing workshop all the time. But not everyone can be a business meeting. It's expensive for us to have multiple ways to engage, right? So the business meeting, no one is going to happen, right? The organization has to function. So we're going to need those business meetings. And there's going to be people that are interested in them. There's going to be people that are sad them, right? But there's going to be people who turn off, who come to a meeting and it's all inside baseball and it's the first time they were ever dropped off in the party and they walk out of the next day. So how do we see it like that? Social events, right? Green drinks, green socializing, power, socializing, whatever you want to call it, right? This is an informal event. And it's more of an opportunity to grow relationships, to have conversations about green politics in a space that isn't structured. And in my opinion, some of the greatest ideas come in unstructured conversation. Uh, the idea comes in unstructured, and then we, we formulate it and get it kind of down a little more before we bring it in structure, right? But this is super low bar, right, for engagement. But when people show up and you have conversations, and then that's when you know, hey, this the same person showed up every day, every day, you know, for six months straight to our green drinks. We should engage that person because they're clearly interested. And educational, right? Panel discussions, workshops, focus reading. Educational is great, and then it's a lot of great opportunities to collaborate with other organizations, right? Um, and that's super important, right? If you want to talk about Right, so it's we can have a panel with fair vote, one of the more to be party member, and we can call rank and vote, which is a national organization. So they've got everybody in Illinois. And now we're working with these different groups, right? And those working with those groups build relationships. They have to advertise it to their members, right? And all of those organizations <laughs> I met are, are not political parties that run these. Rank and vote and fair vote, frankly, are, are organizations that fund the people in the Democratic Party, right? So when we have an event and they fill their people in this, they fill the room with their people, their people are then exposed to the green perspective on it. You can change their minds, you can move them, maybe get them into voting groups for Democrats. In addition to that, educational events help us build a common political perspective. It helps us have a unified community. And we you know, have a direct action or rally, um, something like that, organize a protest. Um, public advocacy or local lesson, right? Those bring in people from well on the side, right? If you have an event on, on a Green New Deal, you're going to get a whole bunch of people that have never heard from the Green, of the Green Party showing up. And now you get to talk to them. And then you can tell them, hey, we also have a panel discussion on the Green New Deal coming up next month. Hey, we have, once a month we have a, we have a social of a holler, right? Oh, hey, you, you like admin stuff? Okay, you're weird, but please come on over to our organizing. Right? But by having multiple layers, we get access to more people, we get access to people with different kinds of interests, and that access is key to growing, you know, to growing the party. If we're only talking to our own people, we're never going to work. So we've got to have a way to I said earlier, we have a really message and media-based political culture right now, where we just, people, you know, political campaigns, Spend massive amounts of money, right? Um, you know, when you hear about Russiagate in 2016 and how Russia spent a few hundred thousand dollars trying to influence our election through Facebook ads, Hillary Clinton spent 80 million in that same you know election alone on Facebook ads, right? Um, so we can't compete with that. 
we can compete in a message-based battle where it's all about buying time, buying ads, right? Where we can compete is knocking the doors. And Peter Schwartzman, our green mayor in Galesburg, was endorsed by democratic organizations. And they gave him walk lists saying, go talk to Democrats. Because they were gonna, they were probably going to vote. And so they just started knocking the doors. And when he found out, he was skipping most of the doors. Because the Democrats only talk to their people. The Democrats only try to turn out their base. Meaning, and the Democrats are a minority party. Right? The largest voting block in every election is non-voters. And then when we get to voters, it's pretty much a third, a third, a third between Republicans, Democrats, and independents. So we're leaving 50% of the people totally off. And then the remaining 50% we're only talking to a third, right? So we're talking to, what, 20% of the voting population, you're only not one. Canvassing is about having long, repeated conversations, right? Um, Research by Talib and Brockman in 2015 to 2017 shows that the door knocking canvassing that campaigns do had nearly zero effect on voting choices. Because you're only knocking the people who are already going to vote for you. You're not catching most people, you're skipping the doors. You're not changing, and very early in those conversations, she didn't change her mind when I debated her on Medicare at all. You know, she said she didn't know. And I said, this is the biggest issue of 2020. Right? 2018, I said, 2018. How can you run for Congress and say you don't know on Medicare? On Medicare for all, right? I got Marcus Hodgson, <laughs> right? He said, never talk to that person again. She didn't change her mind by talking to me, and she certainly didn't change mine by just pointing out, well, I'm so much better than the Republican. Because that's all Democrats have to run on most of the time, because I'm not the Republican. So when you just do a knockback, it doesn't change anyone's mind, and they only see you that one time, and then they make you know, two or four years from now when you're doing the exact same thing. On the other hand, one study from 10 minutes of conversation can have an impact in reducing transphobic feelings about amongst parents. And you can apply that to about anything, right? Think about things that you've had conversations in person with with people that if you would have tried to have that conversation on a Facebook post would have never gotten anywhere. When it's face-to-face, -face, you have to listen. When it's face-to-face, -face, you have to generally have to provide a modicum of respect. Right? When it's face-to-face, -face, you have to actually engage. When you're online, it's just shouting, talking points past each other. No one's listening. But when I knock on your door and have this conversation, you listen. And we, we, we grow a little relationship, we grow a little trust. And then two weeks later, when I knock again, and we continue the conversation, it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And Greens are using this. Um, the Australian Green Party, I think by three or four, they increased their, their, their elected positions in the national government by three to four times in the last election. And when you ask them how they did it, they said, we started talking to our neighbors. We started talking in our community. We started having conversations and building the bridge. Right. So some tips. It's got to be that more than one council, right? Um, you got to have check-ins. You need to start early, right? Deep canvassing is a 24/7, 365 thing, right? We don't just start deep. If you start deep canvassing a few months before an election and hopes to increase your vote, you're going to turn. You're going to end by saying deep canvassing doesn't work. That's because you did a deep canvass, right? You did maybe a few political things, and it's still hard for the election. When you're having conversations that aren't involving both of this person, it changes the value. You can have these kinds of conversations. Don't put them on the spot. If we have questions, listen to their concerns, ask them their concerns all off, right? Over time, make little asks. Hey, we've been talking about this thing. You know, we've been talking about pockets. Like, um, and so here in Springfield, a fun little fact. Our police department and our public works department asked for about the exact same budget that we're here. Police department gets 99.9% of their budget request. Public works gets 30%. Why do water roads suck? Because we're investing in authoritarian policy policies. There's a direct correlation between those two things, right? So when they, when your neighbor that you complain about conditions for roads and the sidewalks where you know every time you talk to them. 
Well, when the, that, when the boat's coming up to spend millions of dollars on a shop spotter system that can't work, that doesn't work, that can't distinguish between a firework and a gunshot, say, hey, you want to come to city council with me? I'm speaking, you don't have to speak, but you just want to be in the room. And now they've taken a small step. Hey, you want to sign this petition? They've taken a small step, right? And we can start stepping people up to more engagement. Really small tasks. Um, Oh, a really important thing that I tell people when, when you're talking about organizing and canvassing, shut up and listen. When a politician knocks on your door or a political candidate knocks on your door, they just start talking to you and tell you why you should vote for their candidate. When a canvasser knocks on your door, on your, door your job is to listen and to help make connections. So when, that, when my neighbor starts talking about me, our road really sucks. Hey, do you know this about the vote? Help them tie in their very localized, you know, small concern with the broader issues, with the systemic issues at play that we need to address. And then, you know, as we have this conversation, hey, did you know that our city is ran by Democrats? Right? This authoritarian policing system we have is supported and brought up by Democrats, right? So the, the people you're voting for are actually acting against your interests. Medicare for all, Green New Deal, all of these things. Um, so, give me some more methods. From organizing in this new industry. So, we did our first organizing 101 workshop in March of 2022. And we used Fox, William B. Foster's organizing in this new industry as a model. Now, He's organizing not only in this guy is not only for organizing workplace, but a specific workplace a hundred years ago. <laughs> right? So it might not seem like it fits. But Foster says we need to individual recruitment. There's a few ways we can do it, right? The chain system. We're members recruit members. In Illinois, we call this bring a friend, right? If every member of the Illinois Green Party enlisted one more person every year. We would double our membership every single year on an individual recruitment level, right? And that would be a huge boom for the party, right? And a relatively low bar for an ask, right? Find one person that will pay their dues and will join the party. And if we all did that, we would see you know, linear growth or stuff. Local recruitment, invite people to public meetings, right? And this is one of the multiple ways to get all comes in. Those are your public meetings. That current number where you immediately enroll them, right? If someone walks in and needs to see anything please, what are your best people you to go start talking to? Not to you sign this right now, but hey, how are you? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And start to build that relationship, right? Um, and you can have, I really, you know, onboarding meetings are awesome. We're going to have some onboarding stuff later uh, with Anna. Um, and then there's mass yeah. education, right? Slowly, publicity, you print the materials. Uh, you know, actions, radio, podcasts, mass meetings, right? I really like this quote, one good mass meeting is better than a dozen with different ones, right? If you're going to do something, do it well. Because if you if you do something and someone shows up and it's mediocre, why would they show up? Um, like a, a big public, uh, like, so thinking about one we've done in this room, um, in 2017, we had a big, we had a mass meeting about fighting fascism, where multiple organizations came together, and we talked about how we can you know, oppose fascism. Um, so it's a, it's a little more open than like your business meeting, you know. Or, or another example would be like, what is the green part? You know, and have people come in to this more, much wider oriented thing. So it's an attempt to get them. You know, hook them, engage them, and then the onboard them later. So in March, we use this Foster's thing. And it, honestly, I know the models, these staples, and all that stuff, and the all that stuff. This was the one where you're like, does it fit? Is this too outdated? Is this too skewed? Less than a couple of weeks after we did our event and we used this, there was an interview with Chris Small. Who organized the victory from the Amazon in New York? And he was asked, What was your model? William Z. Foster's organizing in the steel industry. 
So the one that we thought was out of place and may not apply was so relevant in the modern times to a victory, a bottom-up victory that we saw, right? So like I said in the beginning, these resources aren't made for us. They're usually made for other reasons, but we can adapt them to our world. Um, organizing as introverts. I am not one. <laughs> um, this was written by Garrett Wasserman uh, from the Green Party of Pennsylvania, who's been my partner on doing these workshops. Um, but here's the thing, hold meetings online, even in chat rooms if preferred which we're doing, right? But some people don't want to come out to a public event for whatever reason. Or we, you know, we're just coming out here, you we've know, got a pandemic in hand, and they don't want to go for that. They, they just feel uncomfortable in large groups, right? They feel social anxiety. Offer them different ways to be involved, because they may sit and watch a video, right? And join the things, and then email them later. Uh, provide written feedback and have in person meeting. Um, you know, let people, you know, set our views in before, and we've done that before, right? We have people every spring run in abstention. They're not here, right? But they, they let us go. We want no one to run for this position. Um, uh, we have had meetings where I have sent my opinion <laughs> because I couldn't be there, but I'm like, when this comes up, just say, Chris says this. And they do, and people think it's working or not, but I at least got my voice out. You know what I mean? Um, doesn't mean what you're busy doing, right? Um, if you don't have to go out and knock doors. You don't have to, you know, be a, a chair. Um, you can help on social media. You can do that for your mind. You can do a little straight up work. You can do a little bit. You can do a You can do a You can do a text thing. There, there's so many ways to be involved. Right? There are things that we need to an organizer to organize to make sure people can do them. Not that they're just on the list of something we wish we could do one day. Right? Um, the meeting is perfect. Meet for some specific activity and not just a meeting or unstructured time, right? A lot of times people have meetings that they feel they need to. And that leads to a very chaotic and undisciplined meeting that doesn't really inspire confidence, right? Um, you know, some examples that we use were neighborhood cleanup streets and time game nights are another great way to do social stuff, right? If you're gonna have a group like the time making, because if we're going to have a big march for Medicare for all. There's going to be people who support it, but don't want to go to a big march. It's just not their thing. But they might show up to make signs for it that people can use. And that gives them the, the opportunity to talk to members and build that relationship, right? I keep saying build that relationship. And that's a way that they can do a support work for the larger big public thing that they're doing. Um, my student group, when the Occupy movement was happening, um, you know, we had our protests at the Capitol right down here. I lived at the time eight blocks from the Capitol. So our student group had an open invitation. The morning, you know, if our event was at noon, starting at nine, we're going to gather at our apartment. We're going to have supplies. You can make signs. We all have fun. We all walk down as a group together. And those of them are more people who make signs. Yes, right? But it gave them a different way. We always want to want people to think that they are welcome, wanted in the movement. And as organizers, we need to consider how we how we make our organization more inclusive. How do we make people feel more comfortable? Right. Um, if someone's not comfortable, doesn't feel like they fit in, they're not going to come back. Right. So we need to make sure we do that. And in more grassroots organizations, what can happen, what I've seen happen a lot, is there's a clique that does a lot of the work. And they're kind of isolated from everyone else. So when you come in, it's like, you know, there's the cool kids and everybody else. We want to make sure you don't have Ten things to remember. You will make mistakes, do your best to correct them, and move on. And especially as people who are, you know, proposing a, a truly transformative path, right? We're not just a little gradation off the Democrats, right? We're, 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 we're green proposed some things that are radically different. Medicare for all, for a national health service, a massive Green New Deal that can actually address our climate problem, right? Um, but to do that, it takes a major societal shift. We're not just talking about changing the percentage points on a tax bracket, right? We're talking about transformational shifts. And so, the 
what we're doing, but it's very precarious. And people really like to have like A, B, C, D is going to happen, then we're going to be at E. But that's not how organizing works, and that's especially not how transformational organizing works. We're going to try things and we're going to fail, right? We're going to we're going to try things that worked for other people before, and it's going to fail. We're going to try things that failed for other people before, and it's going to work, right? So we've got to be adaptable and fluid. And when we make a mistake, we can't hang our heads. We got to look at it. So how did that mistake happen? How can we fix it and move on? Right? Go to the next thing. We got to take the lunch and roll off our shoulder and continue on. That's really not to follow through on everything. Double check. I've seen this. I have been very guilty of assuming other people were doing their work. <laughs> During the presidential campaign, that was kind of my policy, and I made it over. I'm doing my work, and I have more work than I can do, so I can't do everyone else's jobs. So I just kind of had to put blinders on and just assume that other people were getting the stuff done. When I did that, multiple times I found out that I'm running and there's no support because they weren't getting the Right? At that same time, be doing that meant that when they got in trouble, they didn't come to ask me for help because I was assuming they were doing it, right? They, they knew that I was that I had that position. Um, it wasn't the best position, but it was a survival thing for me at that moment. Um, campaign is a, a, social, a social process. People like to be asked for help, and they like to be thanked, right? If you want, if you if people come to your meeting and you sit there waiting for them to come to you, that's how they are. You're going to miss a number of people. Right? You need to have clear action items for helping people engage so they know hey, can, is there, can anyone help me on this? And it doesn't always work, right? I can think of times when the Occupy move, our local Occupy dropped the first banner inside of a house chamber, a legislative chamber during the movement. And it was supposed to bail out of $100 million a year to Sears and CM, the Chicago Merc Mercantile Exchange. So we're sitting at the meeting, we know that the vote's coming up, and we want to drop a banner. And so I'm running a meeting and I say, who can make the banner? Okay, I'll make the banner. Who can make, you know, who can bring the, who can get me the supplies? Right? And then we, we, we piece this together. Um, but you don't always, when you ask, you don't always get the response, right? And in the end, we made the banner and we dropped it. And they positioned the Secretary of State Police Officer outside the dumpster for three days to make sure we did the dumpster dive to get it back and drop it in the Senate. Um, you know, but so you've got to ask, right? And the ask one always gets you what you want. But, you know, I got more help than by not asking. You know, I asked, and I was, okay, who can get me the cheese? Okay, who can get me the paint? <laughs> so I ended up breaking down the work. Um, and I ended up doing the actual painting, but other people did come forward and support it. They just weren't able or willing to do the big project. Right? Um, in small races, the personal will usually dominate. Issues matter, issues matter more as the size of the campaign grows. Right? So like, it was like I said with how, low, how large is the manifest you want to talk to someone about the Green New Deal, go on the platform where you're talking about national level things that are happening. The current Congress is never going to happen, right? So, talking about that, a lot of these, these environmental issues manifest to be local and how can we solve them? Right? Start on the first one. The campaign that keeps on the offensive, but being offensive will usually win. Um, I can say from working on the presidential campaign. You know, if we let ourselves be distracted every time a current event came up and got a derail of you know what our messaging plan was, we never would have had a coherent messaging plan because we've always said, "Oh, this thing, this thing, this thing," right? So you've got to keep on the offensive, right? It doesn't mean you don't adjust, but it means you've got to keep moving with your strategy and your plan. You can't let other people and things you can't control. All politics is local, translated issues into local terms. One campaign does not make or break a movement. A losing campaign can, can provide the basis for winning one next time. Uh, Pennsylvania and Allegheny County, which is Pittsburgh, is a great example of this. Uh, they've been doing great work, and campaign after campaign, 
they go from getting 5% to 10, 15, 30, 40. And they are on the cusp of winning the city government or winning you know, something like that. Uh, Baltimore, Green Party, similar. I don't know if people watched Franklin Moore Potts in uh, 2020 running on the school board, but she got 40 something percent. So close, right? And that wasn't because, and that was partially really because she was a great candidate to the existing networks. But part of it was they had been running steadily improving campaigns for years um, to the point that, you know, Maryland has an amazing multi member district system where they elect three people from each district. And in the region, by the time Franklin went, those were at the point of being short and fifth in the elections, right? They were beating the Republicans. So they were building towards that. Um, so just because you didn't win the campaign doesn't mean that it wasn't a victory, right? You need to think about victory differently and think about these races as stepping stones. And they should be fun, look out for each other and avoid burnout, right? If we're not having fun, we're going to stop showing up. Um, burnout, oh my God. <laughs> I think burnout is very much plaguing the ILGP and the Green Party as a whole right now, right? Um, but it, it's something that we have to, and this goes back to, you know, developing a mentor system and training the next generation of people. And then a campaign is a, a chance to show who you are and what you are in favor for. That is not in line with mainstream political politics, right? When you want president, when you want, you know, Republican and Democratic campaigns right now, they're not telling you what they're in favor for. It's mostly attack acts, right? But as means, we need to move for positive music. Talk about what we're for, not who we're against, right? Even if we're voting for what we're against, or we're voting against something, we're never going to get that for. Um, it's an, and use every opportunity to show how our grassroots campaigns are different from politics. Most Democrats aren't happy <laughs> with their party, but they keep the extortion being pulled back, right? So we have to be positive and show how we're different, right? If we're just another great agent, another, you know, if we're just one percent left of Bernie Sanders, we might as well join the Democratic Party, right? We were doing things fundamentally differently. And the only way you can see change on that level is by doing things fundamentally different. What do we do with the guy where we are? And that's all I have. I went a little long, but uh, uh, like I said, we do these once a month, um, fourth Tuesday of the month at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. Uh, they stream on Howie Hawkins, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Uh, the next one is uh, coming up at the end of this month. It'll be Green Party 101. Uh, then we'll do another Socialism 101. Then our Organizing 101, which will be December 27. Um, is specifically going to be about how to reboot a local. Uh, one that we did last month was how to build a local. So if you got involved with the party and you found out there is no local, we worked you through the steps. Uh, Garrett and I pretended we were forming a local, and we walked through some steps and some strategies of how to build from scratch. Um, the next one is something I think is just as important in the Green Party, and that's so your local is fine. How do you breathe new life into it? Right. So uh, thank you very much, everybody.